So Carl made a comment last week that the B team was going to be here this week. So I thought I'd dress up. Maybe that would improve. I might get to A. I don't know, Carl. Do I nearly get to A? You're the anti. You're right. Good morning, church. Good morning, Bill. Uh, this, this message this morning comes out of lessons I've learned in Africa and more recently um, just being involved with Sunlink and the kind of people that Sun, Sunlink deals with. Some of you may know the, the name Phil Yancey and some of you may have read this book, What's So Amazing About Grace. And in this book, he tells a story that was related to him. It was related to him by a friend. And his friend works with the homeless and the down and outs in the city of Chicago. And in the book he says, he said, a prostitute came to me in a hopeless condition, homeless and sick. Unable to buy food for a two-year-old daughter. And through her sobbing and tears, she told me a little of her story. She told me that she'd been renting out her daughter to men who were interested. She made more out of renting out her daughter for one hour than she could make her whole self in a whole night. She goes on to say she had to do it because she had a drug habit to support. And Phil Yancey's friends said, I could hardly bear hearing her horrid story. For one thing, it made me legally liable. I'm required to report cases of child abuse. I had no idea what to say to this woman and at last I asked her if she ever thought of going to church. If she ever thought of going to church for help. And he says, I'll never forget the look of pure naive shock that crossed her face. Church? She cried. Why would I ever go there? I'm already feeling terrible. I'm already feeling very terrible about myself and they would just make me feel worse. Now I think that, that's a horrific story. And, and I don't know what you're thinking right now, but I want you to just hold that story in your mind. And I want to read to you another story. This one's found in John 8, and it, it stands in sharp contrast to the story that Yancey tells in his book. So if you've got your Bibles, or Thanks, Vicky. You've got it up on the screen. John chapter 8. And we'll start at verse 1. And read through to verse 11. But Jesus went up to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning, he came again into the temple, and all the people were coming to him. And he sat down and began to teach them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery. And having set her in the centre of the court, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in adultery in the very act. Now in the law of Moses, it's commanded that that, that woman should be stoned. What then do you say? And they were saying this, testing him, so that he might have grounds for accusing him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote in the dust. And when they persisted in asking him, he straightened up and he said to them, He who is, is without sin among you, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. And again he stooped down and wrote in the dust. And when they heard it, they began to go out one by one, beginning with the older ones, until he was left alone and the woman was there. 
She was in the centre of the court and she straightened up and Jesus said to her, Woman, where are they? Did no one condemn you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, I do not condemn you either. Go from now on and sin no more. So just pray. Spirit of God, we, we just ask that you'll open our hearts, open our minds this morning as to what you want us to show in this passage that we've just read. And we just ask that in your mighty name, Lord Jesus. <coughs> Amen. The story in Yancey's book, This Prostitute in Chicago, wouldn't even consider approaching the church. She wouldn't consider approaching the church in her need. Yet, here in John 8, the woman caught in adultery was drawn towards Jesus. She wasn't repelled. She was drawn to him. And when you look at the life of Jesus, the worse the person felt about themselves, the more likely it seems that that person would come towards <coughs> Jesus. And they would see Jesus as a refuge or a place to go where they could find hope, where they could find grace. And evidently, the down and outs who flock to Jesus when he walked in our world, sometimes the down and outs no longer feel welcome amongst us so-called Christians. We who bear his name and are his followers. And I, I was guilty of this. Uh, the Lord had to use a sharp knife on me many years ago in Africa. And uh, I was visiting a, a man dying of AIDS in Zimbabwe and being invited into his hut, he started to share his story with me. And as I listened, I kept saying to myself, He's made some bad choices. He's made some really bad choices in life. And now he's got the death sentence hanging over him. And when he'd finished sharing his story with me, he offered me half a piece of his bread. It was the last slice he had in the house, sitting on the table. And if you looked around his hut, there was no other food and he wanted to share half of his bread with me. And then after he shared that with me, he wanted to share his Rui Boss tea. And for those of you who know Africa, Rui Boss tea is big, I can't get into it. But he wanted to share his Rui Boss tea with me. And at this point, I'm thinking, what? This man's infected with AIDS and he wants to share out of the same cup? And it was then at that moment that the Spirit of God whispered deep down in my heart and he said, Phil, he's made in my image. You think you're better than him? You've just condemned him. And in that moment, I knew why I was in this man's hut. The Lord Jesus had brought me halfway around the world to meet this man. I was brought there into his hut to teach me a lesson on empathy and condemnation and I was now so grateful that this man had welcomed me into his heart. Jesus had used this man to teach me how to love better. I heard a, a couple of months after my visit 
that he passed away, his man passed away. But, but God had used him to show me love. And so there are two things I'd like you to keep in mind as we consider the lessons that we learn from this story in John 8. First, how awesome is it that Jesus loves sinners? And sinners were drawn to him. And as he walked through our neighbourhoods, you know, people were drawn to him. And I just find it amazing that sinners like you and me today can still find love and grace and, and acceptance when we come to Jesus. And the second point is we need to consider whether sinners and the down and outs are drawn to us because they can see Jesus in, in us and are looking for hope. You know, that Paul says, in Christ, if Christ dwells in you, then you're his ambassadors. So Jesus is on the side of sinners. And in this story, the Jewish leaders come to Jesus with a choice in this situation. The case of the woman who was caught in adultery offered a clear conflict between the law of Moses and the Roman government. And the leaders were using the, this woman as a trap so that they could trick Jesus. You know, if Jesus said that the woman should not be stoned, they would then accuse him of violating Moses' law. And if he urged them to execute her, they would re report him to the Romans. And, and the Romans, they didn't permit the Jews to carry out their own executions. And there, there are two um, Old Testament references that I was looking through that clearly state that the law and punishment for this particular sin, and it's found in Leviticus 20, it says, if a man commits adultery with another man's wife or with a wife or his neighbour, both the adulterer and the adulteress must be put to death. And that's uh, also affirmed in Deuteronomy 22. Although it, it, it's not specifically mentioned in the passage we read, the normal method of putting an adulteress to death would have been by stoning. The law of Moses was designed to safeguard the sanctity of marriage. And it was also to protect the purity of God's people. Now, the Roman government, on the other hand, forbade the Jews from exercising capital punishment. So here's the conflict. The law of Moses said, put her to death. The Roman government says, you can't put her to death. Because in that time, the Roman government controlled lots of areas that they'd conquered. So, and so they were, the Roman government was controlling what was going on in Israel. And, and they weren't giving the, the leaders amongst the Jewish people total authority over their own people. Um, in fact, that's why later the Jewish authorities would take Jesus to Pilate because they didn't have authority to put Jesus to death on their own. So you can see Jesus was in a no-win situation, can't you? For Jesus, the Jewish leaders weren't concerned about the woman who was caught in adultery. They were concerned about protecting the purity of Israel and it was all about trapping Jesus. And it was all about finding a way to turn the government or the people against Jesus and to try and stop his influence or perhaps even get rid of him. That was their plan. But I love the way that Jesus goes about this story. Jesus didn't come down on the side of the law of Moses, nor did he come down on the side of the Roman government. Jesus came down on the side of the sinful woman. You know how awesome is that? And we thank you for right, the Lord's Supper, just for what Jesus has done for us. You know, 
he came down on the side of that sinful woman and that's what he's done for us too. You know. Jesus is on our side no matter. No matter what we've done. No matter where we've been. No matter how broken we are. He runs towards us to defend us. And as we read in that passage there, the Jewish leaders offered Jesus two choices and he didn't take either. Don't you love Jesus' reaction? It was unexpected. He didn't answer them at all. He didn't offer a solution to their dilemma. Instead, there in verse 6, he knelt down and began to write in the dust. Do you know what he wrote in the dust? I have no idea what he wrote. It doesn't say. There's been many suggestions made by people as to what Jesus wrote in the dust and one commentator that I looked at links Jeremiah 17 and verse 13 which reads, O Lord, the hope of Israel, all who forsake you will be put to shame. Those who turn away from you will be written in the dust because they have forsaken the Lord, the spring of living water. This commentator suggests that Jesus wrote their names in the dust and perhaps then wrote a sin that they had committed next to their name. We have no idea. We have no idea what was written in the dust. But you can be sure of this. You can be sure that the Jewish leaders were looking. And they were interested in what Jesus was writing. And you can be sure the sinful woman standing with her, with him, with her head down, she would have been watching what Jesus was writing. You know, and as the patch goes, you know, the Jewish leaders wouldn't leave it at that. They wanted an answer from Jesus. And so they, they kept questioning him. And it says in verse 7, finally, Jesus stood up and gave them his answer. If any one of you is without sin, let him be the first to throw a stone. And then Jesus bent down again and wrote some more in the dust. Once again, we have no idea what he wrote. But we know, we know the effect that his answer had. On those who came to condemn the woman, they left. From the oldest, starting from the oldest, all the way down to the youngest, they left. Until Jesus was all alone here with the woman. Now, Jesus didn't lower the standard of the law, not one bit. What he did, however, was to level the ground in front of him. What he did was to just demonstrate that, yes, this woman deserved the death penalty, but so were those who were there accusing him. They were also deserving of the punishment. Remember what Paul wrote it to the Romans, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And another passage, and the wages of sin is death. And every one of us owe that penalty. So in the presence of Jesus, everyone is on level ground. We're all sinners. We all deserve punishment. We all deserve death. But Jesus came to the defence of the woman not by ignoring her sin and not by minimising her guilt but reminding her accusers that they were guilty too. Mm. 
two things then. One, if you are a sinner, and you are, whether you know it or not, remember that Jesus is on your side. He's always on your side, and he'll always come to your defence. John wrote in his, in his first letter in chapter 2, verse 1, My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, and we all do, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defence, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He comes to our defence. He's always on our side. And the second point, and remember the story at the start of the told by Phil Yancey about the prostitute and how she viewed the church. If we want to help the down and outs and the homeless and the drug addicts, etc., to seek Jesus, and I hope we, we all do, and that's my prayer for this church. My prayer is to see broken people broken people's lives transformed by the grace and the mercy of Jesus. But here's the thing. Here's the thing, and I'm preaching to myself here. We need to drop the stones. We need to drop the rocks. Church, we need to. A lesson that I've had to learn. Remember that with respect to sin, the ground is level. We're all on the same level. We're all on the same level as those sinners around us, those ones out there. But Jesus forgives sinners. When all the accused have been forced to leave by the realisation of their own sin, Jesus says to them in verse 11, and I, and I just love this verse, it's dear to my heart, neither do I condemn you. Jesus' compassion for this woman was not based on her innocence. This woman was guilty. There was no argument about that. And there was no argument that came from her own lips. She offered no defence. She was guilty. And the, as we read, the religious scholars and the Pharisees had caught her in the act. Caught her in the act of adultery. And so there was no point in arguing. The, the, the evidence was there. She was guilty and she deserved the consequences of her sin. She didn't put up any defence, she couldn't. The only thing that was left to decide was not whether she was innocent or guilty, but rather what her punishment would be for the guilt that she bore. And Jesus offered the guilty woman forgiveness. And here's a radical truth that I want us to get today. If it's the only thing you get today, here's a radical truth. Jesus only offers forgiveness and salvation to the guilty. He only offers forgiveness and salvation to the guilty. Sinners are the only people Jesus saves. And of course, we're all guilty. We're all sinners. John in his first letter, uh, chapter 1 and verse 8, he says, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. The point is, Jesus can only save those who acknowledge their guilt. Those who know they're guilty. 
And Jesus said, I've not come to call the righteous. I've not come to call those who think they're righteous. But I've come for sinners. And this woman was willing to admit, she was willing to admit her guilt and to admit that, uh, that it was a requirement for receiving forgiveness from God. The woman was guilty of adultery. That meant the death sentence. And, and it was ranked up there with other sins that deserved the, the death penalty, like murder, kidnapping, uh, if you read in the Old Testament, witchcraft, and human offering human sacrifices. And that was just some of the other sins in the Old Testament where the, the, the penalty was execution. But the severity of this woman's sin did not limit Jesus' ability to forgive her. And you know, that's true today for you and me. No matter how severe the sins are that you and I have committed, they don't limit Jesus. They don't limit Jesus' ability <coughs> to forgive. And the, the, the prophet Isaiah writes, Come now, let us reason together. Though your sins are like scarlet, they, sh they shall be white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, mm. they shall be like wool. Even the worst sinners are wiped clean through the forgiveness that Jesus offers. No matter how severe, no matter how severe the sin, the grace and the forgiveness of God is greater. There are people I know, uh, and uh, there's a few, who will not come to God. They think they've sinned in such a huge way, or sinned too many times, that God certainly won't forgive them. But if God can forgive this woman in chapter 8, and if God can forgive those that hung Jesus on the cross, and if you look at the, the life of Paul, the Apostle Paul, you know, he'd call himself the worst sinners or, sinner of all. But God forgave all them. Then that means he can forgive anyone. And that means you and me. Anyone willing to admit their guilt are not outside of God's reach of forgiveness. Of forgiveness. They're not outside of his grace. Mm. But you know, the opposite is also true. There's those who don't come to God because they don't think they need forgiveness. They define themselves as good people, not sinners. I've got friends like that. Morally, I'm okay. Did you know in the Old Testament of God's law, you could get the death penalty for such things as swearing at your parents or working on the Sabbath or using God's name as a swear word, premarital sex and so on. And what about Jesus' teachings in which he said, look at someone with anger, anger and you're just as guilty as somebody that murders. And looking at a woman with lust you're just as guilty as one who's committed adultery and so on. That was Jesus' teaching. So how many of us stand innocent in God's eyes? Not one. Because we're all guilty. We deserve death. And Jesus' offering of forgiveness was not an indication that he was setting aside the requirements of the law. He wasn't. The woman had sinned. She deserved death and someone had to pay. And the, woman, the woman's accusers, they had sinned and they, had, they deserved death too. And someone had to pay for them. 
There had to be a penalty paid for the sins that were committed. And Jesus would not set aside the law. Jesus said, Do not think that I've come to abolish the law, but to fulfil it. I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will by no, least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law. Jesus wasn't setting aside the law. What Jesus was doing was offering to pay the price. He was offering to pay the penalty for the woman caught in adultery. And he was offering to pay the penalty for those accusers that came to him also with their guilt. He was offering to pay the penalty for you and me. He himself carried our sins in his body on the tree so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. And by his wounds we are healed. And then further on John there he writes, He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. But not just for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. And one more point. Jesus challenges sinners to something better. Jesus said to that woman in verse 11, Go now and leave your life of sin. Go now and leave your life of sin. Now, Jesus wasn't talking about sinless perfection. Jesus was telling this woman, stop making sin the habit of your life. Stop making sin the habit of your life. And in forgiving that woman that day, Jesus faced a danger that she could think that forgiveness was easy. And that therefore she could just go on and sin all she wanted because all she had to do was come to Jesus and he would forgive her for what she'd done. And, and Paul faced that, same, <coughs> that very same problem and he, he, he wrote about it in, in his letter to the Romans. He says, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace can increase? By no means. We died to sin, so how can we live in it any longer? Shall we sin because we're not under the law but under grace? By no means, said Paul. Sin is a very big deal. Sin is such a big deal that Jesus had to give his life. And so if we admit our guilt and come to Jesus for cleansing, and once we come to Jesus for cleansing and find forgiveness and grace, our goal and our passion is to live holy lives out of a love for the one, out of a love for the one that died for me. So here's the truth. Jesus loved this woman. He loved this woman. Even though she was caught in the very act of, of adultery, Jesus still loved her. But Jesus wasn't willing to leave her the way she was. God had something better in mind for her. This woman lived in a family that was dysfunctional. She lived with the guilt. She lived with the knowledge that she was flirting with physical death and that she was also flirting with spiritual death. She was living her own life away from God. And God didn't want her to live in that way and stay in that situation because he had something better. He had something better in mind for her. And that's why Jesus walked this planet. He came to change people's lives. He came to give freedom. He came to give 
freedom to those that were trapped. And he came to bring forgiveness to those that were feeling guilty. And he also gave a future. He came to give a future to those who felt hopeless. He came to bring light into the, those people that are living in dark places. And you know, the, the, the same truth applies to you and me. Same truth applies to you and me. God loves you just the way you are. If you think that God would love you more, if your faith was stronger, you're wrong. If you think that God would love you more if you were spiritually deeper, you're wrong. God can never love you more than he loves you right now. He loves you now with a perfect love. And God isn't willing to leave us, you and me, in this way either. God has something better in mind for us. God wants to change us. He wants to make us better. He wants to make us better than we are now. Better than we ever dreamed we could be. And God's willing to spare no effort in order to accomplish this. Pastor Paul is a way on holidays, as we all know. Over the, over the last few months, has been taking us on through, uh, uh, taking us through Ephesians. And in our home group, we're also going back to revisit Ephesians. But Paul, writing to the Ephesians, talks about how God empowers change in the lives of those who follow Christ. Listen to these words in Ephesians 1, 19, 20. I pray that you will continually experience the immeasurable greatness of God's power made available to you through faith. Then your lives will be an advertisement of this immense power as he works through you. This is the mighty power that was released when God raised Jesus Christ from the dead and exalted him in the highest honour and supreme authority in the heavenly realms. What Paul is saying is the power of God that, used to, that he uses to change us is the very same power that he used to resurrect Jesus from the dead and to install him as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He's installed in heaven where he works his amazing power to change us. How far does God change us? This is what Paul says in Romans 8.30 in changing us. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his own son. That's how far God wants to take you. He'll change you to be like Jesus. And, and that's the kind of change that Jesus was calling the woman to, that was caught in adultery. And that's the kind of change that he's calling me and you. He's calling us to that. And here is what I want us to take away from this encounter and this story that we're this morning. First, Jesus loved this sinful woman and he came to her defence. And I pose this question. Have you found Jesus that way towards you? Even though you're a sinner and he paid a great price for your sin, have you asked him? Have you asked him to come to your defence? And secondly, Jesus offered forgiveness to the sinful woman. I don't know about you, but do you love Jesus? Because he's made the same offer to you? Trapped in sin, guilty before him, Jesus offers cleansing. Jesus offers forgiveness. And if we acknowledge our guilt, 
we will find the grace and the forgiveness. We'll find that grace that only God can give. And thirdly, in this story, Jesus offered something better to the woman. He didn't want her to stay the way that she was. And he also offers us the same. He has something better in mind for us. He wants to transform us to be more like Jesus. And church, grab hold of this. If we do, if the church does that, we'll become more attractive to those outside our walls. I love Jesus because he came to my defence and he rescued me. Let's pray. Father God, we just love Jesus because he loved the simple woman. And we're just as guilty as she was and yet we find that same forgiveness in Jesus that she found. Thank you, Lord Jesus for wiping my slate clean because I came before you guilty. We love you, Jesus, because you think something better of us and want something better for us. Touch us, Lord, so we can touch our world that we live in. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, Sharon. Thank you.